to our fourth episode in the Catholic Mass series. Last week we saw what the liturgy meant from a literal and a historic sense. This week's episode is the second part of this same episode where we'll continue to investigate what the liturgy means. But this time, we'll see the purpose of the liturgy, how God needs to be present for it to be a liturgy, and why it's so important that it has an exterior and a social aspect. In other words, it needs to be done publicly. On sspxpodcast.com slash mass, you'll be able to find all these episodes, videos, and resources. This is free to listen to and always will be. But if you can help with a one-time or a small monthly recurring donation, you'll be making sure that we can continue this work of producing good Catholic content on a regular basis. Now let's join Father William McGilvery for the Catholic Mass, Episode 4, The Liturgy Explained, Part 2. There is one last little thing from St. Thomas, although oh, yeah, it's at yeah, the yeah, risk sorry. of prolonging this uh, unduly. But um, St. Thomas does speak. So we we were there were treating of, of liturgy primarily in, in as an act of religion and so on. Um, but there's also the legal aspect of liturgy that is re- liturgy to be duly performed must be uh, performed in accordance with uh, the legislation of, of legitimate public authority, which in, in the mm. New Testament is the authority of the church. Um, and St. Thomas does speak of this in passing um, under his question on superstition, which is not what we think about necessarily like, oh, a black cat crossed the road, therefore I'm going yeah. to something bad's going to happen. But superstition in the technical sense, uh, as it's used by St. Thomas, refers to um, excess in the worship of God. Um, or, or error, um, deviation in God's worship by excess or by defect. Um, but I think specifically by excess, that's superstition. So it's like going above or beyond what, what is actually uh, called for um, in, in a bad way. Um, so, but anyways, um, he says then, um, this is in question 93 of the Secunda Secunde. A worshiper can be guilty of falsehood in outward worship, especially in the common worship, which ministers offer in the person of the whole church. Um, so in fact, right there, indirectly, you have a, a definition of liturgy contained in that, that phrase there. Liturgy is the common worship, which ministers offer in the person of the whole church. Uh, that is liturgy. He just doesn't use the term, but he defines it in passing. A- anyways, um, so a worshiper can be guilty of falsehood in liturgical matters. Um, because even as he would be guilty of falsehood, who in the name of another person proffered things that are not committed to him. So, you know, if, if you entrust me with, uh, you know, let's say you leave for vacation and you say, Father McGillivray, uh, you're going to, you know, come live in my house and take care of my goods uh, while I'm gone to make sure that, you know, nothing happens to them. And then, uh, so thank you for doing that. I say, oh, sure, I'd love to. And then while you're gone, um, you know, I take your stuff and I give it to my family saying, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving these things to you on Andrew's, on, on Andrew's behalf. He wanted me to. But in yeah. fact, no, you didn't give me any such requirement. Well, I, I'm, I'm guilty of falsehood. I'm misrepresenting your will. Um, and I'm stealing from you at the same time. <laughs> right, right. But that's kind of what you do when you offer public worship without respecting the the laws of the church in whose name you're supposedly acting. Um, so this is a continuous St. Thomas then. So too, does a man incur the guilt of falsehood who in the name of the church gives worship to God contrary to the manner established by the church, making use of her divine authority and contrary to ecclesiastical custom. Um, so... Basically, liturgical disobedience going outside of the, of the liturgical norms uh, falls under the category of, of a, an act of superstition in the terminology of St. Thomas. Ah, very interesting. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, okay, so now Trent? Sorry. Yes, yes, now Trent. <laughs> All right, let's, let's jump into Trent. What does the Council of Trent say? Okay, well, it's, it's short. It's just in the section uh, on the Mass, uh, section 22 of the Council. Uh, there is a reference to liturgical worship in general. Um, the council says, since the nature of man is such that he cannot without external means be raised easily to meditation on divine things, Holy Mother, the church has instituted certain rites, namely that some things in the mass be pronounced in a low tone and others in a louder tone. She has likewise in accordance with the apostolic discipline and tradition made use of ceremonies such as mystical blessings, lights, incense, vestments, and many other things of this kind, whereby both the majesty of so great a sacrifice might be emphasized and the minds of the faithful excited by those visible signs of religion and piety to the contemplation of those most sublime things which are hidden in this sacrifice. Um, so in passing, it's an apt definition uh, of, of 
uh, liturgy uh, through the, the two equivalent terms of rites and ceremonies. That is to say, these are these are the things with which the church surrounds the holy sacrifice of the mass and likewise the administration of the sacraments, which reveals to us through words and gestures um, the those those spiritual treasures which are hidden in in the mass and the sacraments. You know, if we just reduce the mass to its bare essence, like the, the double consecration. Um, there's so much there really hidden inside of that brief act, but it takes about, you know, 30 seconds and it's done. And, uh, if right. that's what our mass was just, okay, consecrate the bread, consecrate the wine done. Uh, we would not be able to access, uh, interiorly, spiritually, the, the all the treasures that are there, the, the, the external rites and ceremonies, which the church adds to that and which constitute her liturgy, um, are there precisely to mediate between the, the mystery contained in that act of immolation or in, in the administration of this or that sacrament. Uh, there's all these spiritual treasures contained in that. And then there's us, and there has to be something which mediates between the two so that we're able to appreciate, understand, savor the things that are being accomplished invisibly uh, at the mass and in the sacraments. Um, and so that's the purpose of the rites and ceremonies. Um, in, in other words, the, the liturgical uh, elements that the church herself adds to the divine elements, which are the, the, the mass and the sacraments. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and I'm, we're going to get into this in a lot more detail and to borrow a phrase that's a title of a Mormon theological book. Sorry. <laughs> Father Pagliarani used it. So I feel like okay. I can, um, pearl of great price, right? The, the, yes. the, the mass is that pearl of great price yes. and you don't just, yes put it on your desk. You don't just put it in your pocket. You set it and you surround it with jewels and you, yes. right. It's, it's, yes. it was a beautiful analogy and he made. And I don't know if he knew it was a book of Mormon <laughs> title, but hey, well, it still fits. To be fair, I think the, the Mormons stole it from our Lord Jesus Christ, because there is the parable about the kingdom of heaven being like unto a, a pearl of great price. So, how did I not uh, it's, know that? <laughs> it's not I need to go back to the Gospels. <laughs> okay, I suppose so. Fair enough. All right, sorry. Well, you're tired, Andrew. It's it's, it's legitimate. Yeah, so we it's started the podcast day. here at uh, Levi. We started at, uh, so, you know, right now it's 11, 23. We started just after 10 o'clock. Um, but for you, it's what, a four-hour time difference? So my yeah. 10 a.m. is your 6 a.m. So yeah, it's, it's been a little early. That's I think right. I can cut you a little bit of slack. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Um, so Trent goes into to all of these things and, and and talks about kind of the hidden mysteries, which again we'll we'll talk in in other episodes, I'm sure, about you know why do we need to make things quiet and silent and what's the point of all that. That's not for this episode, um, but we start to develop, you know, shortly after that, where the mass is codified. Again, we're going to get into that history later, but then uh, Pius V and and later popes who who basically work on the 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 points of, of the Council of Trent on the liturgy start to put together all of these rubrics and rules and things like that to kind of solidify it. And again, we'll get into why, but can you give us a little bit of that history? Because I think that's fascinating. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, rubrics have existed from practically the beginning of church history um, mm -hmm. and you find them scattered in the various liturgical books. You know, there's even before the Missal existed, there was uh, the ancient liturgical ordos, which uh, described the, the manner of celebrating the mass, the ordinary of the mass. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, other liturgical books developed over time, bravery, uh, the pontifical ceremonies, all those, those different things, the Roman pontifical, the Roman ritual. Um, but uh, there was a lot of liturgical diversity, even in the Western Church. And so over time, the Pope started to exercise more and more of an active role in controlling, regulating the liturgy and ensuring that it's always performed in a, in a worthy manner. And so the Mass itself was codified by Pius V, Pope St. Pius V, um, you know, at the time of the, the Council of Trent. Um, and then shortly afterwards, uh, Pope Sixtus V in the year 1588, he established a Roman congregation, which uh, would supervise all liturgical matters, not just the, the celebration of mass, but also the divine office, the administration of the sacraments. Um, it would be responsible for the canonization of saints and their, their, the incorporation of the proper offices of saints in, in the liturgical calendar. Um, and so this is what um, we know as the Sacred Congregation of Rites, originally of rites and ceremonies. Um, interestingly enough, this is one of the 15 original Roman congregations, because before that, before 1588, um, there, there was the 
you know, Sacred College of Cardinals, which was responsible for electing popes. And they would meet in weekly consistories to advise the pope on grave uh, matters, matters of grave importance. Um, but there weren't really commissions of cardinals uh, entrusted with specific tasks except on an ad hoc basis. So, you know, let's say if the, the pope needs to examine a certain question, he would just gather some of his cardinals and say, okay, you know, just for this one thing, this one project, you're going to work as a commission. You give me, you give me your report um, at the next uh, general consistory of the cardinals, and then we'll discuss. Um, but there were no, like, permanent standing commissions like we have uh, today. And it was Pope Sixtus V who created the, the first 15 Roman congregations, which would op- operate on a, on a standing basis um, and in the year 1588. And um, I think it's very instructive to read the, the papal bull, uh, Immensa Eterni Dei, um, which is in the Bullarium Romanum. Um, uh, one of, I forget which volume, but it's it's there, uh, and it's very interesting to read. Um, you see the the traditional mentality of the Pope in in establishing these congregations, because well, first of all, the first congregation that he established establishes, in fact, he, rather he confirms it. Um, it's the the congregation of the, the Holy Inquisition, which would later be termed the Holy Office, and then obviously in, in modern times the. Um, the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is no longer even the the, the highest ranking of the of the papal dicasteries. Um, but at the time, doctrine had had the first place, and it's beautiful to read the little introductory paragraph that the Pope gives in 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 uh, confirming the uh, the Roman Holy Inquisition and, and establishing it as the first of these papal congregations. He says, first of all, because faith, without which it is impossible to please God, is the foundation of the whole spiritual edifice. We, desirous to protect whole and inviolate against all the assaults of hell, this precious deposit, which has been entrusted to us above all by Christ the Lord in the person of blessed Peter, we likewise confirm and establish the congregation of the Holy Inquisition into heretical depravity. Uh, and he follows with, you know, more practical details. Um, but mm. just, it's beautiful. You see that that's the first congregation and its purpose is to help the Pope to preserve in, in violet intact, the doctrine of the faith. Um, and then, so it's in the fifth place that we have this congregation for sacred rites and, and ceremonies. Um, so it's still, you know, among the 15, it's still pretty high up there in importance. But obviously, uh, the lit- liturgy, the, the liturgical law follows the, uh, the rule of faith because the liturgy is an expression, uh, a prayerful expression of the doctrines of faith. So mm-hmm. it's, it's natural that the Pope would put in first place the, uh, the holy, holy office or holy inquisition. And then a little bit later on, the the Congregation for Sacred Rites and Ceremonies. And in establishing it, he explains very beautifully uh, in what these rites and ceremonies, that is to say, in what the sacred liturgy consists and what is its purpose. Um, so he writes, um, and unfortunately, I don't think you can find an English translation in this uh, of this uh, online, so I just did kind of an odd hook translation. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you were going to no, say something. No, I was just saying, oh, okay, okay I, I won't blame you if yeah. there's any heresy in it. Yeah, there you go. Good. <laughs> Hopefully you trust my translational uh, yep, skills. I do. Um, I do. So now, however, since the sacred rites and ceremonies of the church, guided by the Holy Ghost and following apostolic tradition discipline, employees in the administration of the sacraments, in the divine offices, and in every act of veneration of God and of the saints. Okay, pause. Right mm-hmm. there, he's it just defined in what the liturgy consists. Um, okay. So the liturgy, we could, we could take that and, and convert it into a statement. The liturgy consists in the, the sacred rites and ceremonies that the church guided by the Holy ghost and following apostolic tradition and discipline employs in the administration of the sacraments, uh, which would include as well the, the, the sacrifice of the mass, which, which is the source of the Eucharist mm-hmm. in the divine offices. So the recitation of the Psalms and, and hymns of the bravery in, in common, and in every act of veneration of God and of the saints, provided that it's you know performed in an official in official way and in, in accordance with the the law of the church, mm-hmm. so all of that is liturgy. So, um, so because all these things, he continues, are an abundant source of edification for the Christian people, they constitute a profession of the true faith. They inspire a sense of the majesty of sacred things. They raise up the minds of the faithful to the contemplation of the whole of the, of the loftiest realities, and they enkindle in them the fire of devotion. 
So there's the purpose of the liturgy, at least as, as far as it benefits us, the participants. It, it does all of these things for us. We, he continues, wishing to further increase the piety of the church's children and to both preserve and renew the sacred rites and ceremonies used in divine worship, have likewise chosen five cardinals who will be specially responsible for ensuring that the ancient sacred rites be diligently observed by all persons and in all places whatsoever, in all churches of the city of Rome, including our own pontifical chapel, and of the whole world, in the celebration of the Mass, in the divine offices, in the administration of the sacraments, and in all other things pertaining to the worship of God. If any ceremonies have become obsolete, let the cardinals restore them, let them reform, and if necessary, correct the books of sacred rites and ceremonies, and in the first place, the pontifical, the ritual, the ceremonial bishops, let them examine the divine offices for patron saints, and having consulted us, let them authorize the same. Thank you. So, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a beautiful text. It teaches us a little bit of the, about the nature of the liturgy, about its purpose. And it shows the care that the Roman pontiffs had for, um, you know, uh, conserving and embellishing the liturgy, but always in the organic way in which it's, it's developed over the centuries. And so we see, you know, in, in both in, in the promulgation of the mass uh, by, by the Trinity mass by Pius V and in this establishing of the Roman congregation of, of rites, um, the care that the popes had to guard the sacred traditions, they considered the liturgy as something which, which is of apostolic tradition and in, in which it has to, one has to be very conservative, changing only those things which are really necessary in order to adapt uh, the liturgy to, let's say, the, the the progress that the church makes in her understanding of doctrine. Um, you know, for example, when the Immaculate Conception is defined, you start to see the word immaculate referring to Mary appearing in the liturgy. Mm. Um, so there's doctrinal progress, which calls for certain adaptations. Uh, obviously, the adding of new saints to the liturgical calendar as as the church has more and more saints that she can number and, and among those who have been uh, canonized. And... Um, and then finally, um, obviously, you know, uh, there may be other things which require modification, but but it should always be in conformity with the church's liturgical traditions and so yeah. on. And and so this is, you know, again, before this time period, and again, we'll get into this, but before this time period, it was really up to the local churches. It was up to the local bishops to to oversee the liturgy in their own diocese. They had a lot more power in that respect. And, and since Vatican II, now we have kind of this, this seesaw back. Um, again, that's a whole other big, long topic. Yeah. But, but the, the, the Roman pontiff started to reserve all these things to himself in order to keep the abuses, in order to make sure that everything was done, done properly. I'm way oversimplifying it, but that's no, essentially that's, where that's, we are. It's very well said. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so then now the liturgy becomes the, the, the folk, not the focus of the, the, of the Holy Fathers, but uh, it becomes the domain of the Holy Fathers. Um, what did later popes start to say about the liturgy? Are there encyclicals or, or things like that? So, right. To my knowledge, the first encyclical to directly address the topic of liturgy as such is Mediator Dei, uh, an encyclical of Pope Pius the uh, published, I think, in the year 1950. I'd have to check that. Um, so, and before that, uh, the, the liturgy had been touched upon, obviously, incidentally, in various encyclicals. Uh, one noteworthy one would be uh, Salutitudine. Salut uh, I don't know, I don't speak Italian, but it's uh, that's an encyclical of Pope Pius X, um, written originally and, and published in Italian, um, which is why the title is, is Italian, but um, where he treats of liturgical music. And so, incidentally, he'll speak about the liturgy, but uh, only in, in passing and, and, and because he's more interested in, in music specifically. So, uh, really, our, our primary source in terms of magisterial teaching on the nature, the purpose of the liturgy, um, how the liturgy ought to play a role in our spiritual life, all of that, um, we find... In this, in this great encyclical of Pius XII, um, you know, the last of the really conservative popes um, before we get into the crisis of, of, of the church. Um, and he is at the same time wishing to 
teach in a more authoritative way the truths that are already you know received and and accepted by all the church concerning the liturgy and he's also wishing to uh, react to certain abuses which have arisen in the context of the liturgical movement um, but that you know the, the the subject of abuses is something that will be treated later on in this series so for now I'm just going to uh, cite those passages of the encyclical which treat uh, of the liturgy in itself, kind of in the abstract, without getting into the, the problems that had arisen in recent times. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I think I'll, I, I might not necessarily quote all that's in the, the reference document here. So for, for those who are listening, they can go back and, and uh, read through the extracts that I, that I give in the notes. Um, but suffice it to say that um, the Pope, first of all, in, in paragraph three, he uh, breaks down uh, the, the parts of the liturgy, as we've already done and seen in, in, in previous parts of this podcast. Um, so, but, but he, he describes the liturgy as, the, the, in fact, the prolongation of the priestly mission of Jesus Christ. Um, it's the chief means of this pro- prolongation of his priestly ministry. And that's beautiful and something that we haven't really seen yet in detail. Mm-hmm. Um, this is true of the Mass. Obviously, our Lord, you know, as our high priest, he's officiating liturgically when he offers the sacrifice on on the cross um that's a liturgical act it's public worship uh it's it's a sacrificial worship of god um and uh, of which the culminating moment the, the the words of consecration so to speak are you know father into thy hands i commit my spirit um it's our lord's voluntary offering of his own life into the hands of the father um as our high priest um, so that is that is the culminating point of of Christian worship of all all the worship that mankind has ever offered to the Father. Um, it's it's that oblation of Christ on the cross. Um, but in fact, all of our Lord's life on earth was an act, a, a continuous act of priestly worship of the Father. Um, and you know, we we have the testimony of the evangelist that our Lord often with, withdrew into the solitude to pray. He obviously performed the. Um, you know, ritual ceremonies of the old law, which prefigured his, his, his own sacrifice, like the, the Paschal meal. Um, uh, but every moment of our Lord's life uh, on earth, his human soul um, was uh, continually in an act of adoration and praise of, of the father. Um, and then the church's mission is to continue this divine liturgy, which our Lord began, began upon earth um, to continue it through the, the, action of, of her ministers um, who represent the entire church, the mystical body of Christ, which united to the head offers worship to the father. Um, so it's this beautiful prolongation of our Lord's priestly ministry um, through the members, which unite themselves to their, their heavenly head, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and how does this take place? Firstly, at the, at the altar, which is renewing the uh, sacrifice of our Lord, um, uh, representing it, uh, that is making it present once again with the, the sole difference uh, being the manner of offering, uh, which is now unbloody. Um, and then this, this liturgical worship, uh, this priestly worship of, of, of God through our Lord Jesus Christ is also done by means of the sacraments, which are the channels of grace through which, uh, well, our Lord's sacred humanity um, operates. Um, we say in theology and in Thomistic theology that our Lord's human nature is the uh, conjoined instrument of his d- divinity. So grace mm-hmm. is given by our Lord's d- divinity, his divine nature. Grace is a, is a gift of God. Um, but our Lord's sacred humanity is what we call the conjoined instrument of his divinity in giving grace. So grace passes through the, the sacred humanity of our Lord as, as, as if through a channel. Um, but then the sacraments are the uh, separated, the separate instruments of our Lord's humanity. That is to say, it's, they're, they're like a, a, an extension of our Lord's humanity, channeling the graces which come from the divinity of Christ through his sacred humanity and then through the sacraments which he instituted to us. Um, so it's 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 another aspect of the exercise of his priestly ministry, which is continued here on earth through the ministers of the church. Um, and then thirdly, there's the the prayer of praise and petition, which we direct to God, um, which also is as a part of the the liturgy. So those are the three parts: the mass, uh, the sacraments, and then all liturgical praise or worship, which the church uh, publicly offers to God. Um, and then. 
in the so let's see here i think i oh okay somehow i skipped from paragraph three to paragraph 20 in that explanation but I think it's all, <laughs> no, it's, it's the same thing. Um, and in the end of that paragraph 20, um, it, the, the Pope gives a definition of liturgy. So, you know, I think we found various definitions implicitly contained in the writings of St. Thomas and, uh, you know, Pope Sixtus the, 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 the fifth setting up the um, sacred congregation of rights. He implicitly gives a definition of the liturgy. But here we have the first explicit definition given by the, the church's papal magisterium. Okay. Um, and so it's the uh, public worship, which our redeemer as head of the church renders to the father as well as the worship which the community of the faithful renders to its founder, that is Jesus Christ, and through him to the Heavenly Father. It is, in short, the worship rendered by the mystical body of Christ in the entirety of its head and members. So there we have our, our definition. I, I, like, put in, I like little, yeah. short, succinct, pithy definitions. Yes. Those are yes. great. <laughs> yes, yes. So that last phrase is it would fit the bill for a fairly short and pithy definition. Yeah, that's great. The, the worship then, uh, it's understood public worship, but the worship rendered by the mystical body of Christ in its head and members. Okay. It's easy, simple. Okay. Um, then we have, uh, of course, the purpose of the liturgy. Um which is, uh, let's say, there's there's kind of a twofold direction in the liturgy, which we've treated of before. There's uh, the, the the direction going from man to God. There is the offering of of um, you know sacrifice uh, of praise. Um, so which we find in the mass and in the in the psalms and so on. And then there's the sanctification of the church by God by our Lord Jesus Christ, um, which also takes place in the context of this of this public worship. So. Uh, through the mass, the sacraments, and the sacramentals, we we could mention those as well. Um, and uh, the, there is therefore a superior efficacy um, in the liturgy um, because it's not a merely human act, but it's really, um, let's say, in in some cases, the liturgy is actually the action of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Um, in other cases, it's the prayer of the church. Um, but in both of those cases, there is a special efficacy, which surpasses the efficacy of our private prayers. So this is in paragraph 26, where the Pope speaks of that. I, I skipped a little bit in our, in our text. Um, and uh, so he says that um, where there is question of the Eucharistic sacrifice and the sacraments, uh, the, the efficacy of the liturgy derives, first of all, and principally from the act itself, ex opere operato is the Latin phrase, um, because whether it's a sacrament or whether it's the Eucharistic sacrifice, it's Jesus who is himself the, the principal minister. The, the priest is, is nothing but the representative of our, of our Lord. He is the secondary minister. Jesus himself is the primary minister in the mass, um, in the sacraments. It's something, in fact, to contemplate, which we don't sufficiently reflect upon, because um, as, you know, uh, I think the, the the great majority of theologians teach uh, Gary Gould Lagrange, for example, a great Thomist is very explicit on this. Um, the human soul of our Lord Jesus Christ is human intelligence and his human will are active um, and involved in, in every mass and in every administration of a sacrament. It's really, it's not only, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ is God who gives grace through these cha channels, through these means, but even our, our Lord in his sacred humanity is aware of what is going on. Uh, okay, a mass is being celebrated there. A sacrament is being administered there. And it, by an act of his own intelligence and will, um, our Lord's sacred humanity is involved uh, because he is, even as, as man, uh, the principal minister of, of the mass and of every sacrament. So there's an action of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, which is efficacious of itself, um, provided that we don't place an, an obstacle. And that's what we call an efficacy ex opere operato. That is by the accomplishment of the work itself. There, it, it, it's, it's, it's efficacious, provided that we don't resist or place an obstacle. And then um, even in the other elements of the liturgy, which are not strictly divine, but which are ecclesiastical, which are the act of the action of the church um, here on earth, the, the, the church militant. Um, even so, there is an efficacy which is superior to that of our of our private prayers, um, because the church herself as a whole, the mystical body of Christ is always pleasing to God. Um, she's been sanctified by our Lord Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. Um, 
And uh, so, so when the church intercedes, when the church, when a prayer is said in the name of the church, uh, in accordance with their laws, it is the church herself who, as a moral person, has a certain inter- intercessory power um, b- before God, uh, before our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and therefore, when when prayer is said in the name of the church, there there is a greater efficacy to that prayer on account of the the holiness of the church uh, as a whole, as as such. Um, and that's what we call an efficacy ex opere operantis ecclesiae. Um, so by the work of the church working <laughs> to mm-hmm. give a very clunky translation of that, of that uh, Latin phrase. Um, and so that's why, in fact, th- this question came up recently. Someone sent me a question saying, you know, um, do, let's say, is it, is it smart? Is it prudent to, for example, if I want a blessing from a priest or if I want, you know, my rosary blessed, should I go to the priest who I think is the holiest <laughs> for the blessing? And uh, the short answer is no, that's, that's stupid. Uh, because the primary <laughs> efficacy of the blessing is not from the, the, the merits of the, the priest as an individual, but it's because the priest represents the church and the church is always holy and pleasing to God. Um, even in a time of crisis, believe it or not, um, right. the church is still holy and still pleasing to God. And uh, so the efficacy, even of sacramentals, of, of things instituted by the church, and and which are not actions of our Lord himself uh, directly and immediately, but actions rather of the church, uh, mm-hmm. obtaining graces for us from God. The church's intercession is at work in, in every sacramental and every blessing, which is which is given according to liturgical law. Um, and so it's the, the, there's a special efficacy in, in, in view of the church's merits, the church's holiness. So, it, is, um, it is always uh, fascinating to me and, and a great mystery to, to think on that, that our Lord, I don't want to use the term handcuffs himself, but for lack of a better term, and yes, I'm tired still, uh, but he, <laughs> he has bound himself by the actions of, of you, Father, of, of a human, right, of, of a creature. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, you're ordained and you have the consecrated hands and all that, but you're still human, right? And, yes. and so he... he he forces himself or he has promised that he will give grace, that he will perform this sacrament ex opere operato through the actions of a human. And that is, uh, it's a really beautiful thing to, to, to contemplate and to meditate on. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's an astonishing condescension on the part of God. Um, you know, we see the, his humility reflected in the incarnation, obviously that the second right. person of the Trinity would deign to become man and, and suffer and be mocked and scourged and all, and all of this. Um, but also, let's say, his, uh, the humiliations, the condescension of God continues uh, in, in the Holy Eucharist, where our Lord is, is you know, despised, uh, thought little of, mistreated. Uh, there are so many sacrileges committed against, against our Lord in the Eucharist. And also by the, the mere fact that he, he, yes, as you say, he obliges himself to... Um, obey, so to speak, the word of, of the priests, despite the fact that, that, that the priests are, uh, uh, you know, more often than not, not living up to the full ideal of, of the standard of priestly holiness. And even when, mm-hmm. they, when they do, it's still a very, you know, human and imperfect holiness. Sure. Um, but it makes me think of, uh, just in passing, uh, the, there's a catechal in, uh, catechetical instruction of St. John Marie Vianney on the priesthood. Uh, which, which you have to read if you haven't read it before, um, because it's just beautiful, the language in which he describes the dignity of the priesthood precisely in this respect, um, saying, you know, you can have a thousand angels there, um, but, you know, will they be able to consecrate the Eucharist for you? If the Blessed Virgin Mary is there even, will she be able to forgive you your sins? No. But the priest, this, this you know, weak uh, and very imperfect human minister, uh, he has the power to do this because our Lord has given it to him. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, blows one's mind, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to follow up with you on a link so that people can, can check that sure. uh, yeah. source out and we'll Good put idea. it in the show notes. Okay. Um, so lastly, as we kind of wrap up this, this, uh, this episode on, on the basis of litter on the kind of background of liturgy itself, um, the very fact that it is a human, that it is various cultures, means that liturgy can be slightly different based on uh, locations, based on, you know, Father McGilvery says mass slower or faster than another priest, et cetera, right? 
I, I say mine at exactly the right pace, but that, that's enough. Of course question. you do. Yep. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of variety. Um, obviously within the confines of liturgical law, we hope. Um, so, right, uh, we did already speak about the um, divine elements, um, which, you know, have their efficacy, ex opere operato, and those things can't change, like the essence of the Mass as a double consecration of bread and wine, um, using the proper sacramental form. Um, likewise, the, the, the sacramental form, uh, the matter and form of the sacraments, uh, at least generically, and in some cases, you know, very specifically and precisely, it's fixed by our Lord Jesus Christ. The church doesn't have the power to change it. However, um, the human elements, which have been added little by little by the church, uh, by, by the, the authority of, you know, the popes uh, and saints and, and bishops throughout church history, um, those elements are subject to change within certain limits. Um, and especially to the organic development that we've already spoken of. Um, and uh, this explains, the pope says uh, in paragraph 50, um, the marvelous variety of Eastern and Western rites, something that we tend to forget about if we go exclusively to the, the Western Latin liturgy. But, um, you know, there, there are many different liturgical rites, and then there's been gradual additions to those rites over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so all of this, in fact, contrary to the era, the era of archaeologism, which says that we have to go back to exactly as the liturgy was celebrated yeah. in the first centuries. Um, there's, there's a, a, a or an organic development, which is good, which is, which is in accordance with the plan of God um, who, who, you know, the, the Holy spirit leads the church uh, into all truth as our Lord said to his, his apostles. Um, he will lead you into all truth. And that means that the, the church's understanding of certain doctrines becomes more clear and explicit over time. We mentioned, the Immaculate Conception, um, but we can we could mention all sorts of things like, for example, Eucharistic adoration, uh, processions with the Blessed Sacrament, benediction. Those things were were devotions, um, either liturgical or what we call paraliturgical, which means kind of semi semi official, mm-hmm. which which were instituted over time. Um, as a response to the development of doctrine, uh, the, to the, the fact that the church's attention was focused uh, more directly and, and precisely upon this or that element of the deposit of faith. So there's this beautiful progress, which, which takes place over time. Um, organic, not like the, the liturgical revolution of Vatican II and the new mass, um, but organic, gradual, like the development of a plant. Um, and which is, which is good. And, you know, just as for example, if you have a, a, a tree, uh, which has grown over the course of many years. If you wanted to reduce the tree to the size that it had as a, as a young sapling, uh, what you end up doing is actually you lop off, you know, all the branches yeah. and, and you just have this bare trunk, which is ugly, deformed. And that's what happens when you want to reduce the liturgy to, you know, what it was in the beginning. What it was in the beginning was appropriate for that time, but there's this gradual development, um, yeah. which, well, which, you know, anyways, it's, it's, go ahead. it's beautiful. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this is, uh, is, the, the last gospel, uh, this was, this was yeah. something that was not part of the mass for a very long time. And actually the faithful requested because there were special indulgences attached to it. We were, we're not going to get into the history now. We'll do it later, sure. but special indulgences attached to it. And the faithful started asking the priest, could you please say this? And so he started doing it after mass. It starts to get yeah. folded into the mass. Hence the last gospel. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that sort of thing is, is wonderful, you know? For sure. And if I can, let's say, use that as a lead into another subject, and this will involve, uh, I think, skipping probably the rest of Mediator Day, which I recommend to our listeners to read on their own. And they can read as well uh, the extracts, the other extracts that I think are, are particularly relevant in our podcast notes. Um, but what you say there about, you know, this development of, of ceremonies over time, um, that dovetails into what I think would be our final major topic for this this episode. Um which is to say, as St. Thomas himself said, ceremonies are things where, um, you know, the reason why you do things a certain way isn't, isn't normally obvious when it's a ceremony. There's, there's something mysterious there. Um, although often the, the reason for its institution, its original institution, is, is obvious, is, is easy to understand. Um, and, and so, you know, whether it's the last gospel, we know that there is a you know, particular devotion to uh, that, that text at the beginning of the gospel of St. John uh, on the part of the faithful, which, you know, led to, uh, you know, the priest saying it as a kind of thanksgiving originally. 
uh, you know, when he'd get back to the sacristy or even in processing out, he'd be reciting it with the ministers as he, as he processes. And eventually mm-hmm. he just says it at the altar, you know. Um, but, but we find now we're stuck with, well, I, I shouldn't say stuck with, but uh, we have this ceremony at the end of a sung mass where the priest says the, the last gospel and he says it silently and everyone is just kind of waiting there for him to finish. Um, and mm-hmm. if we just you know, want to follow what seems logical or intuitive to us now, we'd say, well, you know, if we're not able to do anything else, we can't sing, we can't chant, uh, you know, why doesn't the priest just read it out loud? Um, yep. it's not obvious, you know, it's, it's, it seems it's, it's baffling, but you know, if we, if we consider the ceremony in its, um, historical origins that it was in fact a, a, a private Thanksgiving prayer of the priest, um, then it makes sense that if it's, if it's his, his private Thanksgiving prayer, he would say it, you know, silently, yeah. that's kind of his personal devotion, which he does at the altar before leaving the altar. Um, so a lot of things in, in the, in the church's ceremonies are obscure until you understand, uh, the circumstances in which they were originally instituted. Um, but maybe that can lead us to discuss more in general, this, this obscurity that we find in, in, in the liturgy. Um, because I think there, there are some noteworthy things that have been said, um, particularly by origin, who I'd like to, to, to quote at the end of, of all this. Um, but, but there's just a few considerations that I think are, are worthy of our time, um, in this yeah, last absolutely. section. Sure. So, so um, Unless you have a, a question already prepared, Andrew, I think, um, you know, I, I just kind of discuss the difference between the reasons for instituting something versus its current use. Um, let's note that um, often, let's say, when the literal practical reason for the institution of, of something liturgical goes away because of, of changes in circumstances, changes in, in, in common practice, um, often a mystical meaning is, is found and attributed to that, that, um, that action, that gesture, that liturgical vestment, which may or may not have been intended at the beginning, but which, uh, because the church is guided by the Holy ghost as, as a rule, these mystical significations do, do fit very well with the, the gesture or the action, even if they weren't the original reason for it being instituted. Um, I think it's easy to find some examples of this with the liturgical vestments. Um, You know, there's the Amos, which, of course, they, they got rid of in, in the Novus Ordo. They said, you know, what's the point of this weird square cloth that the priest wraps around his neck? It uh, doesn't yeah. seem to do anything. So let's get, get rid of it. Let's get rid of the maniple, too. Um, because there is this kind of mentality that if, if uh, the reason for something being there has changed over time, if the original practical reasons aren't there anymore, let's, let's just forget about the mystical signification. Let's just get rid of it. Um, so with the Amos, I mean, the, what was the original practical reason for it? Well, I'm actually not sure there's two things and I'm not sure which, which is the original reason. Um, but the things that you find in liturgical authors and that you can observe one is that this, this piece of cloth that the priest puts around his neck, um, helps to keep the vocal cords warm. If, you know, back in the day when you don't have central heating <laughs> in, in all your buildings, and maybe sometimes you even have outdoor masses. Um, yeah. but certainly in, in, in buildings, which are not very well heated, it's cold during the winter. And, when your you know your throat gets cold, your vocal cords aren't as uh, supple, if that's a word, flexible. They're not. They don't work as well. So it's hard to sing. Um, and so the that extra layer of cloth around the throat was there to keep the throat warm, to keep the vocal cords warm and ready to sing in liturgical chant. Mm. So that's that's a practical reason, which doesn't really apply anymore. We normally are, our buildings are well heated. <laughs> Um, right. The other reason, obviously, is, you know, if you ever observe a monk like Benedictine, uh, Benedictine monk celebrating mass um, and same with other religious, they, they generally have a hood as a part of their religious habit. And so while the alb covers, you know, the rest of their religious habit, there's nothing to cover the hood except for the amos um, and which which serves perfectly for that purpose. Um, so anyways, those are some some practical reasons for its institution. Um, but you know, for priests saying, uh, non-religious priests saying mass in a, in a well heated room, those don't apply. Um, nevertheless, we still have this, this, uh, mystical signification. Um, the MS 
you know, even the priest, when he, when he vests, even though he doesn't wear the amos over his head like a monk would, he still puts the amos over his head for a moment as he says the vesting prayer um, because he calls the amos the helmet of salvation, um, which is a reference to um, a text in Isaiah, Isaiah uh, chapter 59, and then in, in St. Paul, his letter to the Ephesians chapter 3. These, these uh, sacred authors speak of putting on the, the helmet of salvation to fight for the Lord. Um, and so the Amos has been taken to represent that. And so it helps to put the, it still helps even today, the priest to put himself in the mindset of, you know, when I offer mass, when I stand at the altar, I'm engaging in spiritual warfare. Um, and I need to be clothed with all of, all of the virtues in order to worthily fulfill my ministry. Um, so anyways, the, the, because the, that, that symbolical value is still there, we, we right. continue to use it. Um, like was the maniple, which um, uh, money bloom in Latin, uh, which can mean like sheath uh, for binding up, um, you know, grains that you gather in the harvest. Um, but but it's, it's the word is related to manus, which is hand. So it was it was a. Um, a um, kind of you know long handkerchief worn over the arm, um, which the, the the sacred ministers used to wipe their brow from sweat. Because just as you have cold in the winter, you have heat in the summer. Sure. <laughs> you need sometimes to wipe the the sweat off your brow. And so the maniple, a kind of liturgical um, the handkerchief, served that purpose. Um, you know, obviously, we have air conditioning. Don't really need that anymore. And yeah. even when, when sometimes in our ceremonies, especially ordinations, which we have outdoors in a tent, it can be pretty hot. But you know, the 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 maniple is such an ornate garment. You don't really want to use it to wipe right. your sweaty brow. Um, and all the brocade just gets scratchy anyway. Absolutely. So so that never it no longer serves that practical purpose. But it's still a symbol of the work that we have to put into to our to working out our, our, our salvation and that it's something which is you know difficult it's painful we're not all, always feeling very joyful when we when we uh combat temptation or undertake mortifications or do acts of charity or even just do our daily duty of state it's not fun um but that's what's represented by the maniple it's the the labor and sweat of the spiritual combat in this life um and so we keep it because of that signification um, yeah. there's a, you can reference Psalm 125, which, which talks about uh, sheaths or, or the word in Latin is manipula, um, with which we, you know, we, we went out sorrowful weeping to, to sow this, the seed. And then when, when we come back, gathering it up in sheaths at the harvest, we're rejoicing. And so the maniple is a reminder of the, the labor, the suffering of this life, but then the joy that we'll have when we, when we gather up. In in the spiritual harvest, all the fruits of our of our sacrifices of our of our good works. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful. And and you know you, you see this in again in a natural level too when you talk about kind of the hidden meanings behind ceremonies that aren't immediately evident on a natural level. First thing I thought of was you know like Japanese tea ceremony, right? It's beautiful. There's a lot of these little things, and I'm not equating the mass to Japanese tea ceremony. Get out of the comments, but you know, but there's <laughs> you go and you're like. Why are you turning the cup this way instead of this way? That doesn't make sense. That's dumb. No, it's beautiful. Like there's a beautiful cultural reason that's lasted hundreds of years. And I think we, we lose something when we just kind of fall into the cult of utility, right? When our buildings are just utilitarian, when our, when design is just utilitarian, when religion becomes utilitarian, we lose something. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, it's sad because you see that in, you know, there's a link between architecture and uh, religious worship. And so when sure. did Vatican II and, and the new liturgy come about? Well, it's precisely when, uh, you know, people and uh, architects were producing buildings that were, you know, uh, just, just plain ugly, honestly, yeah. like they're, they're just these concrete boxes. And so there's no beauty put into them. It's, it's the idea is, you know, we, we are so proud of how practical our modern technology is that we just want to, you know, build these ugly, you know, uh, concrete boxes. And that's what we'll call our buildings. That's what, we'll, what we will, we, what we will call our churches, uh, yeah. or that's, that's, that's how we will uh, build them. Um, and so unfortunately you see the same mentality in the, in the deconstruction of the liturgy, removing any, everything, which doesn't, you know, have an immediate obvious or practical purpose. Sure. Um, you lose a lot yeah. that way. Absolutely. Well, father, as we wrap up, like we do with, uh, with all these episodes here in this liturgy series, I'd like to ask two quick questions, a minute or two each. Um, first, what is it in researching this episode? What's the one thing that you think would be 
beneficial for yourself and your fellow priests to take away from this episode in order to help them with the celebration of the of the mass? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, I, you know, it's hard to identify one thing um, because we've spoken of so many. Um, mm-hmm. I think that obviously priests in particular need to go back and, and reread the writings uh, of St. Thomas of on, on these liturgical related matters. They need to reread Mediato Dei. Um, obviously, we should have a sense of, um, you know, our dignity as uh, not just as baptized Catholics, which already deputes us in, in a certain way to divine ministry, but the priestly character, which conforms the priest actively to Christ's priesthood. Right. Um, a sense that, you know, the priest is there as a mediator between God and man. At times he represents the person of our Lord, for example, in, in uh, saying the words of consecration or the other sacramental forms. Um, he says, this is my body. He says, I absolve you. So at times he has the dignity of acting in, in Christ's own person. At other times he's representing the church and praying in the church's name, but he's never representing himself. And so, you know, in the liturgy, the, the priest is there to, in, 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 in fact, disappear. Um, all that is strictly, you know, personal, his idiosyncrasies, um, you know, his personal qualities, he should try to let all of that disappear so that he can simply be a channel um, for the graces that, that God, that our Lord is giving to his people, as well as a, a worthy representative of the church. Um, so it's something in which, you know, it, it's in fact an act of profound humility uh, to to follow all of these little regulations that which are in the liturgy, the priest, right. and this is, a, this is something that is different in the, in the new liturgy, the new mass. Um, you know where the personal creativity of the the priest is is fostered. You know he has all these different options to choose among, uh, lots of ways in which he can kind of ad lib or or do something spontaneously, which ref- reflects his own personality. Whereas in the traditional liturgy, the priest, you know, there's not a lot of options and the priest, for the most part, he just disappears um, in, in following all of these minute uh, rubrics, which govern his every word and action. Um, and then at the same time, I would say, you know, for priests, especially, well, uh, learn to appreciate the uh, richness of the liturgy. We've given just a few examples of how things which seem, you know, mysterious or or even on a practical level pointless, have these beautiful mystical significations, and that mm-hmm. makes it to be the case that the the liturgy is an enormous source of of contemplation. Um, the, 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 there are so many things that we can learn about the sacred realities that as as priests. We uh, touch, we handle every day. It's in the in the pontifical for the the, the ritual for the ordination of priests that the bishop says to the priests, um, if I recall well, agnoshite quod agitis imitamini quod tractatis. So you know, know what you're doing and imitate what you what you handle. Yeah. Um, so there's so much richness there, especially for us priests who are entrusted with the duty of of officiating at liturgical offices yeah. and of administering the sacraments. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And well, anyways, I'll leave it there for, for that question. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, finally, same, same question, but for, uh, faithful, what's, what's something that, uh, you think we should, obviously there's a lot to take away from this episode, but if you could kind of hone in on one or two things, what's something that we should be thinking about the sure. next time we go to mass based on this episode? Absolutely. Well, obviously, you know, dignity of the baptismal character, you are deputed to liturgical worship. So be proud of it. Um, you know, I obviously, as a priest, I, I have a lot of interaction with the faithful, as every priest does. And mm-hmm. especially with young people, you know, I see young people who are raised in tradition. Um, and very often, they have no idea of the richness of the liturgy. And um, it's very sad to me to see, you know, when they're not motivated to serve mass or if they just, you know, kind of half learn the responses, mumble them uh, to try and get by and, and not, not make it obvious that they don't really know what they're saying. Um, it's very sad to see that if they want to kind of hang out at the back of the church and don't want to be close to the altar, uh, yeah. whereas, you know, the, the pews in the front of the, of the church are all empty. There's tons of space, yep. you know, go up there and, and get close to the altar so that you can follow, so you can see what happens. Um, you know, read books that, that speak about the liturgy, obviously with, with a certain, you know, caution, ask maybe a priest for recommendations as to good books on the liturgy, mm-hmm. um, because it requires study to unlock uh, the secrets of the liturgy. Um, if I can 
you know, still on on the subject of this 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 question, if I can mention briefly something that's in the notes, which I didn't have time to talk about. Origen, one of the early church fathers, he makes this really remarkable comparison uh, between the prescription that um, Moses gave or God gave through Moses to uh, Aaron and the other priests of the Old Testament. Um, and then the, the way that, that we're supposed to respect the liturgy, um, Aaron and the other priests, when, whenever the Israelites would pick up camp and move from one place to another uh, during their wanderings in the desert, the priests who alone were authorized to see and touch the sacred vessels and the, the, uh, everything, especially in the Holy of Holies, um, the, all of these sacred vessels, they would wrap up in cloths. And then only once they'd been wrapped up, they would then give them to the Levites to carry to transport while the, the Israelites were in movement. Um, and Origen says, and it's fascinating because he's writing in, uh, if I recall well, you know, the maybe late second century or early third, I, I'd have, I think it's the late second century. He's, he's writing so very early on in church history. He says already, you know, there's lots of ceremonies, uh, even, even Christian ceremonies whose signification is not obvious. Like the fact that we, that we kneel to pray or that we pray facing the East, or again, the, the rituals of the mass and of, of baptism, you know, these interrogations that go back and forth between the, the priest and the, the person to be baptized or, or is, or in the case of a child is, is sponsors. Um, lots of details in these ceremonies, which are not obvious. Um, but when we faithfully observe them, we're like those Levites who are carrying these sacred vessels um, wrapped up in cloths so that we can't see them. We can't touch them, um, but we carry them faithfully so that then those, the, the priests who are uh, deputed to handle such things can use them the next time that there's, there's a liturgy. Um, and so mm. let's say the, the faithful, and even the priests who perform faithfully the, uh, the sacred liturgy, um, without having really taken the time to study it and to learn the the profound truths that are that are concealed under the the layer the wrapping of of these ritual actions, um, they are they're like the Levites who are just carrying the things on their shoulders without really knowing you know what what's in there what's what's under the wrapping, yeah. um, and they do perform a valuable service because you know it, it certainly is better to worship God according to liturgical law without understanding the ceremonies and to depart from that law or to make up your own thing. Right. Sure. Um, but it's even better if you, you know, like Aaron and the priests of the old Testament, if you're able to um, pierce through that, that external wrapping and see the treasures that are contained inside. And, and for that, you have to, first of all, believe you have to have confidence that there are treasures uh, which are contained in the liturgy, which are not obvious, which require study in order to unearth, in order to understand uh, study and prayer. Um, and so, you know, someone walking into a, a mass or into the chanting of the divine office or something like that for the first time is, you know, maybe going to appreciate the beauty of the chant, uh, the beauty of the vestments, certain external elements, which, which come across easily enough, but there's a lot of riches, um, which, you know, you can attend the, the traditional lit liturgy, the Latin mass your whole life. But if you've never prayed and studied these things, um, you might be just like one of those Levites that's just, you know, bearing the sacred vessels wrapped up without any understanding of what, what it is that you're, you're transmitting. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would say to people is, is first of all, have confidence that there's riches hidden in these things. Um, spend time in prayer in, in, in you know, when you attend mass, uh, follow attentively the, not just the words, but also the gestures of, of the priest and consider the things one by one, meditate, ask yourself, why is it that the priest wears this? Why is it that he says or does this? And through prayer and through study, try to uncover some of those riches. Um, that's, that's what I would recommend to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Father, thank you so much for this, uh, for this review of, of what liturgy is, where it comes from and, and how we got to where we, uh, where we are in the church. Um, it's been really fascinating. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Greatly right. appreciated. See you in a couple weeks. All right. Thanks. Bye.